there's been so many questions, so much interest in not just Bitcoin, but cryptocurrencies uh, about what's going on, where they came from, where they're going. Uh, there's been so much media uh, interest in it, especially in the last year, that we thought this is a great opportunity to kind of give, we're, we're kind of presenting this as kind of uh, crypto and Bitcoin 101. Uh, what is it? Where did it come from? Where is it going? Uh, what are the fundamentals? Uh, some of that kind of information. And, um, and, and like she said, we're, if you've ever watched CNBC, they have these uh, programs where they have the bulls and the bears. Uh, so jo Joseph is going to uh, be the bull, and I'm going to be more of the bear. Um, and so, but, but you know, we, um, we, we both, and we'll get into this a little bit more, uh, we both see that there's a lot of potential, uh, upside potential for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies but there's also a lot of uh, downside risk as well. And, um, and uh, just start, starting off right from the top, we are not gonna give investment advice. So don't ask us if we, you should buy or sell. Um, and, uh, and, and that's one thing you need to be really careful about. Anything uh, in this area, uh, you need to be very uh, careful and, and consider uh, your options very closely before uh, actually investing in any of these kind of products. So before we start off, I want to get a quick sense. I've actually been asking this question for the last few months when I go out and speak to different groups. How many of you in the room either own Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or have ever owned one personally? Raise your hand. Let's see, what have we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so we've got, we've got a pretty good... So just to put this in perspective, I've been asking this question for about two months, probably about, uh, what, 25 different presentations. So far, I've had two people. Two people of all those that I've spoken to. Now, of course, this is kind of self-selecting because you're, you're people that have an interest in this topic, but there is, uh, so I would consider you to be uh, a, a more knowledgeable and uh, uh, a more experienced group but among the general population. I was meeting with a group of millennials uh, last week, and I asked them this same question, and one person, I had to like pry it out of them. I'm like, come on, just someone. One person finally raised her hand, and she said, I own $3 worth of Bitcoin, because someone talked me into doing something one time, and you know, going on a website, and it gave me $3. And so there is a lot of uh, apprehension and there's a lot of um, lack of understanding of what it is and so that's really where we're gonna go so just want to give you some perspective real quick uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, what's going on in our markets overall right now this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, the smooth line is the 50-day moving average of the Dow uh, and going back uh, to 2015 uh, forward to earlier this year what you see is the Dow was trading in kind of a tight trading range between around 16 and 18,000 uh, for quite some time. And when you look at that moving average, you see it was actually trending down just a little bit going into uh, 2016 and throughout 2016. And then we had what we call an inflection point right there. Anyone have a guess what, what that day is? Election. election day. So the election had a dramatic and, uh, uh, and strong shift in where the markets were going. And we went from about 18,000 uh, right before the election to over 26,000, about 26,600 on January 26, 2018. A lot of that was because of kind of expectations. Markets are driven, and you're gonna see this a lot with, um, with our cryptos. Markets are driven by expectations of future economic activity. So there was an expectation going into election day uh, of, a, of essentially of a uh, Clinton administration and the, that the policies uh, associated with the Clinton administration. And then that expectation was shocked on election day and changed dramatically and went up 48% with this expectation of what was gonna happen with the new administration. And as we know, every time markets go up, they continue to go up forever, right? Trees grow to the sky, and once things go up, we can just expect to continue going up forever. Not really. So January 26th of 2018 is right here. 
Another inflection point. Uh, we've seen a, a major change in uh, market sentiments, uh, in market performance. Uh, now, this red line is important. This is, uh, in markets, if a market drops by 10%, it's called a correction. If a market drops by 20% from uh, recent highs, it's called a uh, bear market. So this red line is the definition of a correction in the Dow. And you can see what the markets have been doing. Coming from this high, we test. What the markets have been doing is they've been testing those lows. And what that means is it kind of hits a low and then it bounces off it. And that's a test. And then it kind of recovers and then comes down and it tests it again. You can see that in the test, it dips even deeper. So what we see is because of this change in the expectation, uh, markets have now fundamentally shifted. And so now we see a much different trend uh, driven by a number of factors. There's not one factor driving this. What's interesting is this one, the first drop, was based on good economic data. What we saw was we saw uh, uh, income go up higher than expected. Now you would say, well, that's good, which it is. But if income goes up, then the expectation is that inflation will also go up. And if, if inflation goes up dramatically, then the Fed will get more aggressive at raising interest rates, which will cause money to shift out of markets uh, and into other uh, investment areas. And so that's where we saw this first drop. The second drop uh, is a little more concerning to me. This was based on the announcement of the Trump administration of uh, potential tariffs, starting off with uh, steel and aluminum, but then spreading uh, to a number of different uh, uh, areas, especially with China. And so we're, so we're seeing kind of a, a change. And then just yesterday, we came close uh, to dropping below that uh, 24,000, that correction level again. Today, we're up a little bit. We're up uh, just over 200 points. But you can see, look at that dramatic shift from just straight up. And when a market's going up, every bad story is ignored, and every good story is a buying opportunity. When the market's are, are shifting to more downward, uh, good stories are often ignored, and bad stories are selling opportunities. And so we're kind of seeing that, that sentiment change. And so with that, with that overall, but you know, you can see, look how we dropped. We dropped all the way down, 10% drop in the Dow in the space of, uh, of just a few days, and that's a pretty dramatic drop. So with that in mind, up 40, 48% since the election, but then down 10%, what does Bitcoin look like? So here's one day, one day of Bitcoin. This was a day when they got good news. So what happens? On, on one day, uh, Ripple's, what, which is one of the other cryptocurrencies, jumps 30%. Bitcoin goes up 15%. So on a good news day, Bitcoin goes up 15%. Other cryptos go up 30%. What about a bad day? Unfortunately, yesterday was a bad day for cryptocurrencies. Uh, there, was, um, there was a technological problem with uh, Ethereum, and, uh, and it caused people to lose confidence, and so Bitcoin goes down 10%. So on a good day, Bitcoin goes up 15%. On a bad day, it goes down 10%. And you can see how dramatically that is. Look, it was way up to 9,700 about midday, and by close, we're down to 8,600. So these huge fluctuations uh, going on in Bitcoin on a continual basis. And one of the interesting things, one of the really fundamentally different aspects of, of Bitcoin over maybe like the stock market is trading is literally 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's not, you know, the stock market, it's from 9.30 to 4. And, you know, and there's a little bit of extra activity before and after, but not much. Bitcoin, you can go on, uh, on a Bitcoin exchange at 2 in the morning on Sunday and, you know, buy as much Bitcoin as you want. So it is fundamentally different, and we see, and some of that adds to that, uh, that volatility that we've seen. Joseph, do you want to kind of get into uh, some of the specifics of the technology? I'll just run this. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, guys. Um, one thing, I know everybody keeps saying I'm a big bull, uh, and I am, but it, it's... Uh, it's important to differentiate being excited about the technology itself 
and it as an investment. Those are two different things, and I think there's exciting times ahead for the technology itself. The investment, that's a different question. Uh, so to kind of get started, I think it helps um, when thinking about Bitcoin and some of these cryptocurrencies, you know, why were they created, where do they come from, and kind of the time frame that they developed in. So in 2008, um, a mysterious figure, Satoshi Nakamoto, he presented an idea for Bitcoin. Uh, it was later developed in 2009. Um, but what was going on in that time? Well, the financial crisis was going on. So at that time, you had a lot of people, a lot of groups that were very distrustful of mainstream financial institutions, Wall Street, government, the Federal Reserve. So this, this small group of people got together and they said, look, let's create a digital currency, a digital form of cash that we can use outside of the mainstream financial institutions. So basically, anybody here can go and download a Bitcoin wallet, okay? And I can download a wallet, Robert can download a wallet, and we can send each other Bitcoin. All you need is an internet connection. So you can send money anywhere in the world. You can send Bitcoin anywhere in the world. Um, but what's important to realize is, okay, that's well and good, but currently, if I, if I want to send a normal transaction to Robert, I send it, the bank processes it, verifies it, makes sure that it gets securely to Robert. But in Bitcoin, you don't have that, right? You're trying to operate outside of the normal banking institution. So what do you need? You need somebody in the middle to process that transaction and make sure it gets to Robert. So again, anybody in this room can sign up to be, you just download software on your computer, sign up to be what's called a miner. And so you guys can all on your, on your computer set up to have a mining system. You can have it set up. So when I send a transaction to Robert, it goes from me to you guys. You guys process and verify the transaction, and then it goes to Robert. All of those transactions are recorded on a digital ledger, just a record of accounting. Every transaction is put on the ledger, and every transaction is what they say immutable. So it can't be changed. The ledger cannot be changed. So this is the kind of the idea that they developed. It's a direct peer-to-peer -peer currency that is verified and processed by a diverse group of people all over the world. It's decentralized. And everybody can see the records. Everybody can see that ledger. And it maintains the accuracy and trueness of the record. Now, one thing to remember is that Bitcoin doesn't come out of nowhere. So the, you guys don't verify these transactions just out of the goodness of your heart. So when you verify transactions, you're rewarded with Bitcoin. And that's how Bitcoin comes into existence. Is that if you verify a transaction, you add it to the blockchain, and the blockchain is that digital ledger. You add it to the blockchain, then you're rewarded with Bitcoin. So that's how it's created. It's basically just a digital form of payment that uses the blockchain to verify and process the transaction. Um, so we can go ahead and change. So it's important to keep in mind that there's two different things. You know, you have Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is using blockchain technology to transfer the money. But blockchain can be used for all different kind of things. It's basically a dispersed ledger that everybody can access and see and add to. And it can't be changed. So for instance, like this morning, IBM, IBM just announced that they have developed a consortium of jewelers uh, and miners, you know, for diamonds. So what they're going to do is, from the beginning, when a diamond is initially mined, they, they can scan it with a QR code, add it to this blockchain that cannot be changed, and every step along the way, so the miner sends it to the cutter, the cutter then scans that again, puts it into the blockchain, and so on and so forth down the line until it gets to the consumer. The consumer can look at that and say, look, this came from a mine, this is not a blood diamond, this is not a fake diamond, all these transactions are true and correct. So, so, so one, of the, one of the real values of the underlying technology of the blockchain is essentially this ability to, uh, uh, to essentially have these transactions or have these interconnections without an intermediary. And uh, a, a great analogy that I've heard is it's kind of the difference between the old Microsoft Word and uh, Google Docs, where if you remember, if you were working with a group, let's say you're on a group project, you're working on a report, and there's you know, several of you. So what do you do? When you go into the document, you click on the track changes, right? And then you make your changes, and you email it uh, to the next person. And that person tracks changes, and then makes additional changes, and emails it to the next person. So it's a very uh, controlled process. 
Uh, blockchain, on the other hand, is like Google Docs, where everyone has access to that single document at the same time, everyone can make changes at the same time, everyone can see everyone's changes at the same time, and it kind of drops those, uh, those barriers and drops those uh, costs and, and difficulties of uh, coordinating between a variety of dispersed groups. Now, what's, uh, and we're, we're mostly talking about Bitcoin, but Joseph, how many cryptocurrencies exist right now? Oh, there are thousands. Uh, 1,500, I don't know, there's a lot. 1,500 cryptocurrencies, and how many of those have risen up in the last year? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the majority of cryptocurrencies have emerged in the last year. So what we see is we see, now Bitcoin's been around 10 years. Uh, blockchain has been around roughly the same t uh, period of time. What we've seen is in just the last year, we've seen this explosion of interest in the technology and an explosion of, um, <clears throat> of these, what they call them is uh, uh, ICOs or uh, uh, initial, coin, initial offering. coin offerings. So it's, it's, it's kind of just uh, a way for individuals and companies to try to benefit from a lot of what we're seeing. We're also seeing a lot of publicly traded companies changing their names to employ, include Bitcoin or to include blockchain in their names. Uh, and that is a, is a really interesting sign of what we're seeing with the, uh, uh, the interest in this uh, overall technology. Yeah, and, and what's also important to know is that a lot of these cryptocurrencies currently, they don't have a, a working product, right? They're, most of the time they're just ideas. So the initial coin offering that Robert's talking about is one of these, it doesn't necessarily have to be a company, but a group of people or people can say, hey look, I have this idea to create this certain kind of financial instrument or use blockchain in a certain way. They publish that and then they go out and they raise money through an initial coin offering. They sell a bunch of coins that may or may not be worth anything and that's how they raise money and then they create the product later down the line. Sometimes there's a lot of projects that have raised billions of dollars that don't even have a product. So, what, And while we're at it, who did you mention created Bitcoin? Satoshi Nakamoto. And he's, he's pretty famous, right? And He's done no. a lot of interviews. He's, he's, he's unknown. It's unknown if it's a person, a single person. So, so no one has ever people. met the creator of Bitcoin. There are people that claim they are the creator, <laughs> but they may not be. <laughs> so, uh, but that's kind of part of it. Is it's kind of this outside of the uh, of the normal process. It was this person that no one's really ever met that created it. His name may or may not be real. Um, there, we don't really know who owns it because it's kind of dispersed. So it is really kind of, when you think of a normal company, you think of you know, the board of directors and you think of the CEO and you think of uh, their, their property. This is fundamentally different. It's throwing everything that we've uh, kind of based, the, uh, based uh, companies or products on, on its head. Yeah, so we can go to the next one. So anyway, so you know, what have we been seeing? Over the past year, uh, basically cryptocurrency markets, price of Bitcoin have just gone crazy. Um, you can see at the beginning of 2017, Bitcoin just under $1,000. Uh, towards the end of 2017, up at around 20000 So that's just, you know, almost a 2,000% gain. That's crazy. I mean, you won't get that anywhere in the traditional stock market. But it's so volatile on both sides. So just, you know, from the end of 2017 till now, we're down roughly 60%. And it changes from day to day. It's, I mean, these, these prices will change, you know, 10, 20% a day. So... It's hard, hard to get them, but anyways, next one. Okay, so these are some of the, the major cryptocurrencies. You know, you have Bitcoin, Ethereum is another main, uh, it, it's based on the blockchain technology, it's more used to develop um, decentralized applications. But then you also have Ripple, they have a cryptocurrency to settle international settlement payments very fast. Um, but anyways, as you can see, all down majorly over the past several months. Real quick, Joseph, do you want to talk about kind of what caused this turning point? Yeah, so I mean, there's several different reasons. You know, when I put these charts together, and there's later on, you can see uh, on here, it has some of the events. But um, before I researched, all I had to do is go back and look at my text messages with my little brother. And it was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, Bitcoin is falling. Why is it falling? You know, uh, and it's because of a lot of those events on here. Um, I think one of the major turning points was right around here, uh, CBOE, uh, a futures exchange market, started to allow 
Bitcoin futures to be traded, and that basically for the first time allowed institutional investors to bet against the price of Bitcoin. Um, previously, it just basically gone up because that's really the only way that you could play, play the market was up. So you had CBO, uh, CBOE futures. On this side, you had CME group, another futures group uh, who also launched their futures. And then all along the way, and you can see it in there, and we'll talk a little bit about later, but there's events. Most of them are rumors or reports of different governments cracking down on Bitcoin, on um, other cryptocurrencies, on the exchanges, and things like that along the way. Okay, so the question is, is Bitcoin a bubble? And uh, so I, I want to dig into that a little bit. You know, what is uh, an asset bubble? Uh, there's a few different examples of it. Uh, probably the most classic one is the tulip mania in the Netherlands in the 1600s. And so uh, most people don't realize this, but tulips were introduced to the ne Netherlands. <clears throat> they actually originated in Turkey, but uh, in the 1600s, uh, in the mid 1600s, they were brought to the Netherlands by Turkey and everyone just loved them. They fell in love with tulips. And then there was a variety of tulip. It was actually infected with a, uh, with a virus, but it didn't kill the tulip. What it did was it caused the colors to change and they were striped or spotted or different and that got everyone excited. And so the value of those different tulips started to go up. And then people started to speculate. And they said, hey, uh, when people are coming into the country, they're gonna wanna buy more of these. And so, uh, so it started to build on each other. Uh, uh, growing higher and higher, you can see the spike in tulips. So before Tulip Media started, uh, a, a tulip cost about the, uh, the same as an onion. At the peak of Tulip Mania, one tulip cost the price of a house. After it was over, it was lower than the price of an onion. So you can see, you know, imagine someone selling their house to buy a tulip, and then a year later, it's back to being worth less than an onion. And so that scared off, or scared so many people. In fact, the, the government tried to come in and support uh, the level of tulips by saying, we will, uh, we will cover part of the cost, but then the price fell below what the government could afford to cover. And so people literally lost everything over tulips. Now, so, so you know, that's kind of your fundamental. Then we've got the dot-com boom and bust of the, uh, of the uh, uh, turn of the millennium, right around uh, 2000. Again, we have new technology. It's just coming on board. Everyone's excited about it, uh, and everyone starts driving that up. And what did we see? We saw companies changing their name to include .com, you know, pets.com, shopping.com, everything was .com, and we just see that driving up. The problem is, you get up here, and then eventually, people start stepping in and saying, wait a minute, when are you actually gonna start making a profit? When are you actually going to uh, be able to have some kind of a return, a hard return on the, that investment? And when that started to happen, it started to drive that price down, and uh, now, there are a lot of companies that, that are around today that were formed during this period. If you think of Google, what is Google? It's Google.com. You know, what is Facebook? It's Facebook.com, Twitter.com. They're all .coms, and they're all very successful and very uh, uh, valuable companies. But for every one of the Googles or Twitters or Facebooks, there's a thousand other .coms uh, that have come and gone and uh, ha have just essentially disappeared. So then we come forward to Bitcoin, and you can see that dramatic increase in the price. Uh, again, uh, Bitcoin is about 10 years old, and we've seen just in the last year a spike, a really big increase. Now, what's happened lately? So what does a bubble look like? So what are kind of our stages? You have the takeoff, and it kind of goes up, and then there's a little sell-off. You have, they call that the bear trap. And then you start getting media attention, enthusiasm, greed, delusion, and you know, the, this is my favorite, the new paradigm. You know, you've heard this, everyone says, no, it's different this time. Trust me, it's different. It's gonna be the, the new normal. This is, everyone's gonna be using this product and it, it, it can only continue to go to the sky. But then 
you start to see the downside. You've got denial, and then you've got a little bull trap, return them to normal, and they say, oh, we're back. But then, you know, this is like the 10 stages of grief, right? You've got fear, capitulation, despair, uh, and then kind of a return to the mean. Now, not directly, but look at the shape of this, of this graph. Now, look at this. You've got, you've got uh, Bitcoin, kind of, there's our, there, there's our first little bump, kind of comes down, and then we have it just jumping right up. People are saying, this is the new normal. Everything is going to be in Bitcoin from now on. Cryptos are going to take over the world. And then we start, now everyone's making money on the way up, right? There's only one way to make money. Just like Joseph said, one way to make money is to buy. But once, they, once Bitcoin gets, and the cryptocurrencies get uh, included on uh, the, kind of the secondary markets, uh, or on the, uh, the exchanges, now you can make money on the way down by selling it short, by betting that it will go down. So people, a lot of people are making money by driving the price down. So we kind of see that happening. Now, th but the big question, though, is did we hit a high? Is 19,000 the all-time high? Is this the low? You know, is the price right now around seven, 8,000 the low? Uh, or are we, are we gonna go back up higher again? Or are we going to go to zero? Joseph, do you want to talk about that? Oh, wait. Oh, and th this is just showing one more. Uh, so this is comparing directly uh, the uh, changes in the NASDAQ uh, to Bitcoin. And you can see how similar the dot-com bubble is to what we've seen in Bitcoin. Uh, uh, the uh, NASDAQ is in blue. Bitcoin is in red. Now, these have been indexed just so we can compare them side by side. Let's look at the absolute value. Uh, or, or change in value of Bitcoin compared to some other classic bubbles. So uh, we've got Bitcoin right here in dark blue. Uh, here's the tulip mania, comes up to about half of what Bitcoin is. Uh, you know, we hear so much about uh, the, uh, the Great Depression and the, the crash of the stock market in 1929. It's right there. <laughs> so just think about that scale. The scale of what we're seeing with Bitcoin is so much bigger than what we've ever seen before. And that's why it's getting so much attention. And, and if it does, uh, well, and you know, if Bitcoin takes off even more, it, it, it is uh, fundamentally different. But uh, that underlying technology as well really has the potential to change our lives. But is Bitcoin, the big question is, is Bitcoin or are any of the cryptocurrencies the vehicle that are going to take us there. Okay. Well, this graph is a little off, but um, so, anyways, I, I think when looking at Bitcoin, you know, the the page you have in front of you, and you can see right here, it's just a massive spike. But I think it's also important um, to kind of understand the context of these boom and bust cycles that it goes through. Now, I don't think Bitcoin is going to go up forever, but I think it's important to understand the history of other cycles that it's been through and kind of think about that. So one thing is, will you flip to the next slide? So this is 2011. 2011, Bitcoin rose from about $0.09 cents to $29.60, went up, that's about 32,000%, and then declined 92%. So when I was doing research for this article, uh, for this presentation, I wanted to see how many other presentations were named the rise and fall of Bitcoin. Well, kind of one of the prominent tech magazines, Wired Magazine, wrote an article that kind of brought to light some of the, the history of Bitcoin, what it is, how it works, kind of to a more mainstream audience. Um, that was back in 2011. So we've been talking about the rise and fall of Bitcoin for a long time now. Um, and it's just, I think it's important to keep in context. You go to the next one. So this is 2013. 2013, Bitcoin rose 3,300% and then declined by 70%. And the next one. In 2014 to 2015, Bitcoin fell by you know, 82%. So when is it that Bitcoin is dead? If you go online and you look at old his, uh, newspaper covers, magazine covers, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of reports that Bitcoin is done through with capiche done. So, Question is, where are we in the cycle? Are we really done? Maybe, maybe not. But anyways, <laughs> continue. Uh, the next slide. So the next slide is here. And then if we go back, can you go back to the very first of them? So if you go back, I know the chart's a little off. But if you go back, nope. in there you, you can. Sorry, it's, oh, no. still, it's still going back. 
Hold on. There we go. So you can see those, those rise and fall. So this is the first one. 92% fall, 70% fall, 80% fall, 65% you know, percent fall. So where are we in the overall scheme of things? I, think. Okay, I don't know. Where are we? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, and this is just kind of just some interesting information. One of the things is, is interest of the public. Um, you know, we've, we've known about Bitcoin for a long time. We've heard about Bitcoin for a long time. So what this is doing is this is looking at a, a Google Trends report. So Google searches on Bitcoin uh, compared to the price of Bitcoin uh, going back to 2013. And you can see, it's really interesting. As that price goes up, it gets that media attention and uh, interest spikes. It goes down and interest goes down. Again, the, the price starts going up and interest goes up. Price goes down, it goes almost to zero. And now, you know, in 2017 and 2018, it spiked. As that price starts to go down, look how quickly that interest goes down. But now we've got another, you know, movement up and there's a lot of interest, especially uh, just in the last week or two, interest has gone way up as Bitcoin has started to uh, increase in price again. So you can just see how closely correlated those are, that it really is tied to uh, individual interest and media attention on, uh, on, on Bitcoin. So I mentioned Bitcoin's been around for about uh, 10 years. Uh, you know, I, I, I doubt uh, there are many people around that don't know what Bitcoin is. Uh, but what's interesting uh, is how many institutional investors are uh, willing to invest in Bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency? And so that's what this question is. Uh, released by the uh, Wall Street Journal. And we see that 11.2%, roughly, what's interesting, roughly equivalent to uh, ownership in this room, about 11.2% are willing to invest uh, in uh, cryptocurrency. So even though uh, Bitcoin has a 10-year history, it's still barely cracking into uh, institutional interest and institutional willingness to invest. So there's still a long way to go before, uh, before institutional investors and overall investors have enough confidence to be willing to uh, invest in cryptocurrencies. Joseph, do you want to hit this one? Okay, yeah. So just to get to this in a second, I do, like what Robert was saying, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of institutional investors and some of the larger investors are waiting for more regulatory clarity. They don't want to jump into a space that they're not sure what's going to happen to in the future. Uh, but kind of looking at, at, you know, the background of Bitcoin a little bit more, you know, Bitcoin as a means of transfer of value, as a digital cash, it, has, it doesn't have any backing. It's not like, you know, the U.S. dollar, which has the backing of the, of the U.S. government. You can pay your taxes with it. Um, you know, there, there are some issues, and there are some issues also with this. When you think about when you develop a currency outside of the banking center, um, and you don't use all the verification processes that go into it. Anybody can sign up for a Bitcoin wallet. You don't need ID check. You don't need credit check. You don't need anything of that. So in some ways, that's where you get some of the bad rap for Bitcoin as being used for, you know, drug, drug trade, terrorist financing, those things because... Dark web. Yeah, the dark web. So basically, anybody can participate in this. Um, so basically, what you know, there's different... Uh, ideas on what Bitcoin is. Is it just a currency? Is it just a transactional system? Um, or is it something else like an asset? Is it something you hold on to like gold? Um, it kind of depends. You know, Bitcoin is capped at 21 million Bitcoin. So the idea behind that is that the, the value of Bitcoin will just keep going up as more and more people want it. Why they want it? I don't know. It's up to them. Um, Today, I think, uh, today, sometime tomorrow, the 17th millionth Bitcoin will be mined and come into the world. So basically 80% of all the Bitcoin is already out there. Um, it's gonna be capped at 21 million. Some people see that as a reason to invest in it. Some people just think that's just another feature of it, so. How many in here have heard of uh, Napster? Okay, the, most of you have heard of Napster. Uh, how many of you use Napster today? No one? Come on, it's like change the world. So we use, every one of us use the technology that Napster developed. 
that ability to download songs and be able to move them onto uh, your computer or to be able to stream those songs. Uh, and Napster, it did. Napster changed the world. I remember 20 years ago when it first came out, I was literally downloading songs 24 hours a day. And every time one finished, I started the next one. And, um, and it was like the Wild West, right? You just kept downloading. And even if you didn't like the song, or if you, even if it was a bad version, you just do it. Because you know, you know that eventually it's going to end. And sure enough, it did end. And what happened was regulation came down. And the courts came down. And the, uh, and the vested interests essentially sued and shut down Napster. Now, they didn't close down the company. They shut down the ability of people to download those uh, without paying for them. And so Napster uh, was not able to survive uh, that regulatory system. Now, what do we have now? We have the technology that Napster developed being used by Apple or by Amazon or by, uh, uh, what's the other one, Spotify. So it's being used. The technology is being used, and there's a lot of companies making a lot of money. I just heard just last week uh, streaming and downloading songs just passed CDs as uh, the greatest source of revenue for uh, music companies. I was actually surprised that it took this long. I thought it had happened years ago. But so we've seen the change. You know, who, who buys a CD anymore? I mean, it's all on your iPhone or it's all, you know, on your, on your computer. And so we've all changed. The technology has fundamentally changed how we interact with music but Napster's gone. So that's the, one of the questions is, even if, and I do believe the bit, uh, that blockchain is going to fundamentally alter how we interact financially, uh, it might not be Bitcoin, it might not be Ethereum, it might not be Ripple. Uh, it could be a company, it could be an existing company right now that uses that, this technology and blows them all out of the water. But that's one of the, the struggles. There's, you know, is Bitcoin, uh, I could see a, a, a possibility of a year from now, Bitcoin being $100,000 per one Bitcoin. I could also see the possibility of Bitcoin being zero. And, there, and that's one of the struggles with something as volatile as this new technology, is we really, because there aren't those fundamentals, because it's more like a commodity than a currency, and because we don't have that fundamental store of value, there's a, there's a very high upside, but there's also the potential to lose everything on it. Okay, so yeah, th this is just some more of the, it kind of goes along with the handout. Just, it, it just really shows that the price is driven by a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors, a lot of reports of crackdowns by different governments. And just, you know, th th I, I, I pulled this out of um, uh, the news just today. Um, so these are the kind of things that are facing Bitcoin. What it, it says, regulators worldwide are cracking down on cryptocurrencies. India's next. So we've heard about South Korea. We've heard about China. We've heard about uh, Europe, you know, India. The big question is, what's America going to do? How is... Uh, the, uh, how is the U.S. government, how are U.S. regulators going to treat uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? We don't know yet. So we're still Napster, uh, you know, in, in you know, 2001 right now, and we, we're just kind of waiting to see how this will be uh, treated by regulators. Yeah, so as Robert was saying, there's a lot of confusion over one, how do you label something like Bitcoin, uh, what, it, what jurisdiction um, does it sit under? Does the Securities and Exchange Commission regulate it? Does the CFTC regulate? Who regulates it? Um, there's also, a, and another thing to understand is that these cryptocurrencies and crypto com companies, they're not all the same. Many of them are vastly different. Um, something like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, has a very libertarian ideal. We want to exist outside the government. We want to be decentralized. We're not a company. We don't want any kind of regulation and good luck trying to regulate us. Now, there's other companies like Ripple uh, who says, look, we, Ripple ha owns a lot of a currency called XRP. They say, look, we want to be regulated. You know, regulation is good for the space to grow because it provides incentive for outside investors, those big investors, to really move into the space. But, you know, it can take years to develop, to go through the regulatory process. The, uh, the old head of the, the CFTC, Gary Gensler, he just said, look, I think maybe Ripple 
and Ethereum should be categorized as securities and should be re regulated as such, but that's a two-year process. Um, so that's just, that creates a lot of uh, uncertainty. Now, just because, like Robert was saying, you know, China bans Bitcoin, India against it, just because they're against Bitcoin, it doesn't mean that they're against uh, cryptocurrencies or creating digital currencies or, or exploring the blockchain. So I know the EU is, has, is developing um, kind of a regulatory framework around how these companies can kind of um, bring some of the products to market and work with them. Uh, it's kind of like a re regulatory sandbox where you have the ability to kind of use it and have like real test case scenarios. China has been talking about creating a, a, dig a centralized digital currency. Russia, there's a lot of talk now, Russia wants to ban some cryptocurrencies, but they're open to creating the crypto ruble. Venezuela created the crypto petro. Yeah, that's a great example. You know, so you we have want to a, do what Venezuela's doing. A lot of countries that are saying, look, we want to hold off on all this outside stuff, but they're still exploring opportunities inside the country and different ways to use the blockchain, blockchain technology. Yeah. I thought you wanted this one, Robert. So no, anyways, the next one. Are you, okay, so anyways, these are some common crypto acronyms. If you hear them on TV, online, on Twitter. Uh, so FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. You hear this one coming in all the time now with in mainstream reporting, especially CNBC, which has really picked up on the crypto craze. They actually uh, have, if you turn on CNBC kind of in the afternoon, they'll sometimes have a Bitcoin tracker going yes. on, like on the screen all the time. So uh, typically what happens is when the price goes down, everybody on Twitter starts blasting out, you know, rumors and reports, and everybody says, stop spreading the FUD because you're tanking the price. FOMO is on the way up, so everybody's afraid of missing out on, this, on these massive price gains. I mean, I think I was looking upstairs before I came down here. There's some cryptocurrencies that are going up, you know, 70, 80 percent, you know, just, just this morning. And why? <laughs> well, people all pile in because they're afraid of missing out. Um, another one, so HODL. HODL is a very popular one. So back in the early days of crypto, some guy had too much to drink. He went online and he tried to ask his friends, should I hold on to Bitcoin? But instead of saying HODL, he said HODL, he spelled it. And it's kind of become like a meme kind of thing on the internet now where everybody just says long-term holding of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency is HODL. Now, that's, that's kind of the, the traditional meaning of HODL, but I want to, the impression I want you to kind of leave with is uh, what a lot of people uh, uh, define HODL as, which is hold on for dear life. Because, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of that, uh, that roller coaster with overall stock markets. We see it with, uh, with overall equity markets. You saw it with, with even the Dow. And so there is up and down. But uh, cryptos are one of those examples where they're way up or they're way down and you never know what's gonna happen the next day. It's uh, an exciting time, but it is something where you need to be really careful about uh, if, you're going to, if you're gonna buy it, you need to go in with your eyes wide open, understanding that yes, you may double your money overnight, but you may also lose everything overnight. And the probability of, of those is uh, pretty even. And so that's just uh, something that you need to be really careful about. So um, okay. thanks so much. Uh, we've got about yeah. 10 minutes left. Yes. And uh, we, we have some questions that people uh, submitted before. And then we'll also, uh, maybe Joseph, we can mix in some questions from the audience as well uh, while yeah. we're doing this. Uh, absolutely. So yeah, thank you all for the employees who sent in questions. They were very thoughtful, very good. Um, well, mostly. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> and they, uh, they really gave us kind of a template on how to. I'm lucky at you. <laughs> <laughs> So anyways, Rob, yeah, so, so these are some of the questions, and just because I don't ask your question doesn't mean I don't think it's good. They're all good. We can talk about it later. Um, so going back to the idea of regulation, Robert, um, there's a lot of uncertainty now. A lot of regulators are kind of competing uh, over who has jurisdiction, who's going to regulate. Um, if, if you were advising the regulators, um, how would you advise them to regulate some of these cryptos? Well, and, and what's really interesting about this is Bitcoin has been around for a long time. It's been around for 10 years. They've had time already to regulate it, and they decided not to do it, uh, and they still haven't uh, stepped in yet. But uh, you know, with that recent interest, with that big jump in, uh, in Bitcoin and the price and in the interest, we are going to, I, I'm, I'm pretty confident in the next couple years, we will see regulation. And I think uh, what, one of the things that regulators need to be very careful about 
is they do need to uh, ensure safety. They need to ensure security. They need to make sure that people have confidence uh, in the products. But also, uh, government regulation should not be shutting down these markets, should not be preventing people access to these uh, instruments. And so I, I would say we need to take a very uh, careful and deliberative process towards regulating these. We don't even know, this is one of the crazy things, we don't even know who will regulate them. You know, we talk, it could be the SEC, could be the FDIC, could be a, a, a number of different uh, organizations and they all want to do it. Uh, but uh, we need to be really careful in not constraining the growth of this overall technology. Okay, so another one has, what do you think about the future kind of mainstream adoption of Bitcoin and some of these other cryptocurrencies? Uh, what do you think is kind of impeding that or what may spur it to, to increase? So this is one of the, the, the tough parts. Um, for uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to really be considered to be uh, a replacement or uh, a kind of uh, like a currency is they have to be able to process transactions very quickly. So uh, right now uh, Visa processes approximately what, 1,500 transactions a second and Bitcoin can process about four. And so uh, some of the other cryptocurrencies are faster but for them to legitimately uh, be able to uh, replace existing currencies, they need to be much more efficient. They need to be much uh, easier to use. They need to be accepted widespread, which right now there's only limited uh, acceptance of the technology. And then one of the problems is one of the, the, the uh, you know, one of the benefits. The reason people are buying Bitcoin is not to use it as a currency. They're buying it with the expectation that it's going to skyrocket. With a, uh, with a commodity like that, it has very limited usefulness in uh, an exchange of, of wealth. Uh, there was a, a guy that in about 2013 uh, bought a pizza uh, with about, I think he bought it with like 10 Bitcoin. I mean, th that pizza that he paid 10 I think it was 10, 10, Was it 10,000? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so 10,000 Bitcoin and he bought a pizza. That pizza is worth like a billion dollars now, right? So why would you ever spend your Bitcoin or your Ethereum or your Litecoin or your Ripple if <coughs> tomorrow you expect it to be 10% um, higher and a year from now you expect it to be 1,000% higher? We've got to stabilize those markets before they can be really viable. Should we uh, take any questions? Are there any questions from the, from the audience? Yeah. Uh, I, I personally think it's huge. I mean, I think you already see that most of society is going cashless. We don't use cash nearly as much as we use anymore. And I think that when you have some of this technology that maybe right now is not fully implemented, but in the future will cut down on times like international transaction settlements. I mean, right now, like Ripple, they're partnered with Banco Santander, and they're using an application that uses um, Ripple software to send money remittances between like Spain and Brazil and Portugal, like almost instantaneously. And when you do that, and when you kind of take out um, uh, a centralized, like a, a bank, you, the centralized money centers, then you start talking about maybe lower fees and things like that. It'll be interesting to see. I, I think there's a lot to that. And central banks are exploring that. Even the US has, t they've spoken a lot about improving the US payment system. And they've talked about introducing uh, you know, digital payments. I mean, you can think if everybody in here has access to a digital currency account established by the Federal Reserve, there's a lot of different things that they can do with that. They can, you know, if they want to spur the economy, they can put money directly into that. There's a lot of different things that they can do with that that they can't do currently with traditional cash. And I think one of the areas where it has a potential to really have a lot of upside is in those underbanked areas. Uh, mm -hmm. like sub-Saharan Africa, where the bank system may be very thin or may be corrupt or you know, they can't trust the government. Those are areas where you can kind of get around it by using uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. In established, I mean, in a place like America, it's a lot harder to make the case uh, for using them because our system works so well and it's so efficient. Yeah. Uh, but most of the world isn't uh, run as well as America or the developed uh, nations. 
Ma'am, did you have a question? Very little. Very little is being transacted. I think there was probably more being transacted by, back when that guy bought his pizza with 10,000 Bitcoin. But why would you buy anything now yeah. um, with Bitcoin when you think it's going to go up? And there are you know, some companies that take it. Overstock.com is one of them. Uh, there, there's, uh, you know, there are some you know, kind of small retailers, uh, you know, pizza places or, th or coffee shops where you can spend it. But a lot of people aren't. I think we need to have that price settle before people are gonna really be willing to use it. One of the interesting things, one of the kind of benefits or arguments in favor of Bitcoin. So the, the value of all Bitcoin in the world right now is around $200 billion. That's also the value of all the gold in Fort Knox. So imagine if you took all the gold in Fort Knox and you wanted to move it from Tennessee to California. That would be really difficult and very expensive, right? You'd have to load up the trucks drive them across the country, you'd have to have security, you'd have to have a massive amount of infrastructure, it would be very, very expensive just to move that gold. And this is one of the interesting things is uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, they literally have a store of gold and the way countries move gold around is they literally put the gold on a forklift and drive it to the bay of the different countries. Uh, it's an amazing thing to see, but it's very inefficient. With Bitcoin, you could take that entire $200 billion, put it on a thumb drive, and stick it in your pocket or give it to someone. The ease of transferring that money is so much lower. The barriers of that is so much lower that it's one of the benefits, but it's also one of the problems. Imagine if you could walk into Fort Knox, take all the gold and throw it in your pocket and walk out. That's one of the struggles with this technology is what is so beneficial is also what makes it so dangerous. And it, that Bitcoin, if someone does put it on a thumb drive and walk away with it, you will never see it again. Just yesterday, part of the reason Bitcoin dropped was there was a story about a, a group hacking and stealing some Ethereum. We hear a lot of stories about uh, cryptocurrencies being stolen. We don't ever hear stories about people being busted for stealing cryptocurrencies because it's just the nature of it is it's very difficult to track that. Let's see, we're just about out of time. Um, maybe one more, sir? Yes. Um, as far as initial acceptance of, of technologies, things like credit cards, when credit cards came into play, wasn't there a lot of initial resistance from government as well as larger institutions? And if so, if that's true, I don't know the exact history of the uh, of credit cards, but yes, I mean traditionally you have the same thing with the internet. Everybody says, "Oh, the internet—that's just a crazy idea. That's never going to work." And now look where it's at. I mean, we we can't imagine our lives without it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I think honestly, just that Bitcoin and cri cryptocurrencies have been around for so long. I think it's little by little. Um, they kind of chip away at the system. There's no doubts that there are big uh, incumbents and governments um, who would like to um, keep it at bay, um, but uh, times change. I think it just takes time, and I think it really takes uh, clarity from the regulators. I think that's going to be the biggest thing. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's going to take that regulation because, because individuals need that certainty. They need to know that I can trust this product. They need to know that I, 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 I can put my life savings. You know what you know that if you take your entire retirement account and put it into cash, you can put it in your safe and it'll, you know, unless your house burns down or someone steals it, you know, that it's going to be, it'll be safe and it'll be worth something tomorrow. We need to have that kind of certainty with cryptocurrencies that we know if we, if we download it or, you know, purchase it or move it into our accounts, that tomorrow we can then use it to buy something and that, that, that you know, those transactions will uh, be recognized 
by the banking system, by the, the government. And so that's where, that's where really we're waiting for that regulation. We're hoping for that re regulation. And we're also hoping that it will be the right kind of regulation that will encourage the technology and not inhibit it.